tragic incident in September 2022 occurred in a villa located in Yangjongdong, Busan Jinggu, Busan Metropolitan City, coinciding with the Chuseok holiday. News outlets reported that Yihana, a mother raising her children on her own, took the life of her daughter due to financial hardships and subsequently ended her own life. However, as the investigation unfolded, the nature of the scene suggested it was too horrific for a mother to have inflicted such harm on her daughter, leading to suspicions of possible homicide. In South Korea, this case is infamously referred to as the Bellflower Juice Murder of Busan Xiangjongdong. Let's delve deeper into it. On September 12, 2022, at around 12.50 p.m., a middle school boy awoke in his room to find his mother, Iana, and his high school-aged sister, Kim Chedim, dead. He sought help from a neighbor, who then reported the incident to the police. Upon arriving at the scene, the responding officers discovered Kim Chedim strangled in a room while Iana was found with stab wounds in the living room. Given that there were no signs of external intrusion, it was initially suspected to be a tragic case of familicide. The disorderly state of Chedim's room and her physical injuries combined with knowledge of Iana's hardships raising her children after divorcing her husband in 2021 painted a somber picture. By July, just two months before the incident, Hana had registered as a basic livelihood recipient, indicating extreme poverty. It was speculated that perhaps under the influence of alcohol and during a heated argument with her daughter, Hana committed the acts in a moment of overwhelming emotion. If Iana had indeed been responsible, the case would have concluded without prosecution. However, as the investigation progressed, the evidence did not support the theory of the mother killing her daughter. Valuable jewelry that the deceased mother Iana had been wearing was missing, and suspicions grew when the daughter, Kim Chirim's mobile phone, could not be located. Gradually, the police began focusing more on the possibility of murder, extending their investigations to family members and acquaintances. Detectives who first arrived at the crime scene noted several irregularities. Unlike in typical homicide cases, Iana was found in an unusual position, kneeling as though in prayer. While she had stab wounds, they weren't fatal. The actual cause of her death was asphyxiation, and a blanket had been placed over her after death. The limited blood spatter suggested she had been immobilized at the time of her death. Furthermore, the daughter, Kim Chedim, had a missing tooth and a swollen face, suggesting she had suffered a forceful blow. Like her mother, she too was found covered with a blanket. Her upper body, especially her face, had severe burn marks, indicating an attempt by the killer to disfigure her. However, just as with her mother, the cause of her death was asphyxiation. Investigators found it hard to believe that even in a fit of rage, Iana would inflict such harm upon her high school-aged daughter. While reviewing nearby CCTV footage from the estimated time of the crime, detectives observed that the digital door lock showed no signs of tampering. This led them to consider the possibility that someone who had been granted access to the home Potentially a close neighbor from the same villa complex could be a suspect. At the time, the son, who was in contact with the local police station, appeared so disoriented that he could barely walk, as though he had been drugged. A neighbor had to report the incident on his behalf. Later on, the police discovered that shortly before her death, Kim Chedim had texted a friend saying she felt dizzy. Her symptoms were similar to those of her surviving brother, leading the police to suspect possible drug consumption. On the day of the incident, while chatting with friends, Kim Chedim began to behave oddly, sending messages full of typos. Much like the unusual physical reactions of her younger brother, Chedim mentioned she had consumed bellflower juice, which someone had given to her, saying it's good for her health. Shortly after, she began feeling dizzy. 
Suspecting potential drug involvement, police urgently took blood and urine samples from the surviving son. Subsequent autopsies of both the mother and daughter, along with tests on the son, detected the presence of a psychiatric drug. The son had earlier mentioned that he drank a healthy bellflower syrup provided by a woman he referred to as Auntie, living on the third floor of the same villa. Detectives tried to check if the syrup underwent any color changes when the drug was added to it. This became crucial as the auntie from the third floor, who had given Chedim the bellflower syrup and was suspected of discarding her phone, vehemently denied any involvement. She even insinuated that the surviving middle school son was the suspicious one. While searching the third floor auntie's residence, detectives discovered stored psychiatric drugs, including those identified in the victim's bodies. The bellflower syrup, originally yellow, turned pink when mixed with a small amount of the suspect's drugs and deepened to almost purple with a higher concentration. The son had clearly remembered the syrup as being purple. Furthermore, a strange grinding tool was found in the neighbor's handbag with traces of the drug on it, indicating she might have ground the pills to mix with the syrup. Despite the mounting evidence, she vehemently denied any wrongdoing. The woman's testimony was inconsistent, and she even expressed resentment, claiming that the juice was medicinal and that both she and her daughter had also drunk it. However, the woman became a suspect in the brutal killing of Kim Chedim. The nature of Chedim's death was so strange and unnecessarily brutal that it led investigators to doubt that her own mother could have been responsible. She claimed that she did go into the house, but she never saw Kim Chedim. However, according to CCTV footage, Kim Chedim entered the villa at 10.54 p.m. to order food. This was three minutes before her mother, Yana, who arrived at 10.57 p.m. and subsequently shared the delivered food with her. During a witness interrogation, the woman was observed to have a cut on her right finger that appeared as though it had been nicked by a knife. The investigative team interpreted this as a wound that could have occurred if the knife had slipped from her hand while she was stabbing and then pulling it out possibly due to insufficient strength. When asked to demonstrate how the wound might have occurred, she kept changing her explanation and appeared fumbling and inconsistent. But the wound on the victim closely resembled the type of cut that often occurs when individuals, unfamiliar with using knives, handle them for the first time. Moreover, at the crime scene, scorch marks from setting Kim Chedi alight were evident all over the floor. Even though there were burn marks on both of her hands and the soles of her feet, the suspect consistently denied the evidence, suggesting that the marks could have been from activities like cooking or repairing doors. Investigators also focused on a white t-shirt with English writing, which the son claimed the suspicious woman wore every day. If the police could locate this shirt, which might bear a bloodstain, it would bolster the case against her as a killer. Initially, the suspect denied owning such an item of clothing. However, when the investigative team confirmed through CCTV footage that she indeed wore it almost daily, she evasively responded that it had gone missing after she washed it and hung it out to dry. What happened to Kim Chim's phone? In fact, the investigative team considered Kim Chidim's missing phone at the time of the incident as a potential murder weapon. Kim Chidim, who had an unusually high number of facial injuries and one missing tooth, was believed to have been struck with a somewhat solid object with sharp corners. The detective suspected that the only missing item, Kim Chidim's mobile phone, might contain crucial evidence. Eventually, a few days after the incident, investigators found Kim Chedim's mobile phone in a sewer near the crime scene. However, the phone that had been disposed of was meticulously cleaned to such an extent that not even Chedim's DNA was found on it. 
the perpetrator. Having meticulously wiped away any traces of fingerprints from the Guinness beer can found at the crime scene, left the investigators at a loss. From then on, the team eagerly pursued the DNA of the woman referred to as the third floor auntie. The Busan investigative team, pinning their last hopes on a breakthrough, sent the burned and shriveled quilt, believed to have been used to suffocate Chedim, to the National Forensic Service for analysis. From the blood stains on the edge of the quilt that Kim Chedim was covered with, a mixture of DNA from both the suspect and Kim Chedim was discovered, with the suspect's DNA being more prevalent. The suspect defended herself, asserting that since she frequently entered Kim Tidim's room and touched the bed, it was natural for her DNA to be present. She audaciously claimed that she often spit, suggesting her saliva could have been splashed onto it. However, the concentration of DNA from the scorched quilt was too high to be from mere splattering. The suspect's downfall came when she was caught with jewelry stolen from the murdered Kim Tidim. On November 25th, following her daughter's testimony that she had pawned the stolen items, the police apprehended her on suspicion of murder and violations related to drug possession. The suspect, who was in such poor financial condition that she couldn't even pay her electricity bills and owed money to her family, reportedly stated, I will make money even if it means killing someone. About 25 days before the incident, she had used a similar method to intoxicate another victim with a drink laced with psychiatric medication in order to rob the victim. This person's testimony proved crucial in the investigation. So this is what happened that day based on the investigation. The mother, Iana, was killed first. The suspect, who had not repaid the money she borrowed from Iana, attempted to steal a bracelet connected to a ring worth about 3 million won that Hannah frequently wore. After the obviously drugged children went into their room, she forced Hannah, who was conscious, to drink the drugged bellflower drink. She then brutally attacked Hannah, who barely regained consciousness, and subsequently killed the stumbling Kim Chedim, mutilating her body afterward. She then stole the mother's bracelet and the young girl's accessories too. The stolen items haven't been found yet. Ultimately, on April 28, 2023, the court sentenced her to life imprisonment following the prosecution's request for the death penalty. The court emphasized the brutality of the crime. Along with the life sentence, she was also ordered to wear an electronic monitoring anklet for 30 years. However, the defendant didn't show any remorse, even in court. She appealed her case, and in the first appellate trial on July 5th, she shed tears, denying all charges and asserting her innocence. The prosecution, which also appealed, made a strong case for the death penalty for the defendant. They emphasized her heinous actions of brutally killing victims who had shown her nothing but kindness, and her steadfast lack of remorse or grief denying all her wrongdoings throughout. The prosecution's vehement approach had a reason. The suspect spared Iana's son. The boy, a middle school student who typically slept at dawn, unexpectedly went to bed at 9 p.m. on the day of the incident. He slept an astonishing 15 hours, only waking at noon the next day to report the crime. This lengthy sleep initially made him a person of interest for the investigators. However, Throughout the interrogation, the suspect consistently refuted all evidence, alleging that the son was lying. She even proclaimed in court that the son was the actual perpetrator, leading to suspicions that she might have deliberately spared the boy to frame him later. The sole survivor, having lost both his mother and sister, is racked with shock and guilt after witnessing the gruesome aftermath. He is currently under the protection of a victim support team, undergoing psychological counseling. The second appellate trial is scheduled for August 16th, a verdict that will already be public by the time you watch this video. In any case, 
it's profoundly disturbing that someone would murder two individuals with whom she had a close relationship merely for a gold bracelet. The mother and daughter must have profoundly trusted this person to welcome her into their home, sharing their door lock password and affectionately referring to her as Auntie. It's chilling to realize that from the outset, her intent was to end their lives and make off with a few pieces of their jewelry. That's all for today. Thanks for watching.